given us all rather a, a lot to think about. I think rather an alarming picture of all of those £50 notes flying off into the... Into the I was wondering where they were going to stop, but uh, uh, very alarming. Uh, and I think particularly telling your observation that uh, the debt is there to be repaid by our children and their children beyond that. But uh, I, I expect, given the nature of the audience, that there will be quite a few points of view about what you've said. And um, what I'd like to do is to open it up for questions. And um, there are roving microphones. Uh, if you could uh, put your hand up if you want to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, and if you could say your name and the organization you represent, that would be very kind. So who would like to ask the first question? There's one in the middle there. Thank you. Uh, my name's Alex Swallow, and I'm from the National Benevolent Fund for the Aged. Um, it might be quite a large question, but perhaps you could uh, help me a little with it. I'd like you to engage a bit with some of the arguments put forward by the book, The Spirit Level. Um, particularly, I was interested with reference to the comparisons between the countries, and just, I'm not an economist, but the basic argument of the spirit level, uh, as far as I understood it, is that um, equality of income either achieved through uh, progressive taxation or achieved through um, salaries starting off uh, reasonably equal uh, leads to equality, greater equality, greater social equality in society. And I'd just really, really be curious to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah. Thank you. You've argued, Mark, very powerfully about the freedom to create wealth. Um, but in talking about um, uh, income levels, you've used averages. Um, and uh, in London especially, we're very aware of the big gap between uh, the wealthiest people and the poorest. Um, and I'd just particularly like to ask what you think about um, the fact that the poverty in London is growing fastest as I understand it, in households where there is a member of the household working. Um, and um, I just wonder whether limits to freedom are in terms of responsibility of employers and what your, what your perspective would be on the London living wage, for example. My name's Jim Winter from St. Saviour's in Southwark. Um, really, two points. One, one a comment, then a question. Just looking at the, the countries that you chose, and in particular the the two countries or the two areas that you, you focused on most, which was the UK and Hong Kong, arguing that you know, Hong Kong's got freedom and a high rate of growth and the UK's got less freedom and a low rate of growth. I think you could argue it's a bit selective, those two, and that they're not kind of immediately comparable. And if you look, say, for example, at the two largest economies in the world, uh, you look at the United States uh, with a growth rate in the region of, say, 3%. Uh, you could argue possibly that that's a free-ish economy. And then you look at, say, the second largest economy in the world, China, uh, with a growth rate in the region of 9 to 10%. You could argue that's a less free economy uh, and also quite closely related to Hong Kong. Um, so just, you know, is it selected? And then I'm just curious to know, what, what do you think should be done in Greece? What would be your solution to the problem in Greece? Three very simple questions. Um, <laughs> Look, on the, on the spirit level, it, it, it's, that merits a lecture of, of, of its own, okay? Um, the, uh, for those of you who are not aware of it, the, the assertion uh, by uh, Wilkinson and Pickett in the spirit level is, um, and, and it's almost one of those perennial end of history assertions, actually, that we have now reached a level of wealth in the West, in particular. Uh, I think they set the level of, if you're on about an average uh, income of about 15,000 US dollars a year, that sort of anything above that is, if you like, not worth worrying about as much as a quality is worth worrying about. So the, I'm putting words slightly into their mouth, but to illustrate it, uh, their view is that a society in which everybody is on 16,000 US dollars a year is a much better society than one in which half the population are on $20,000 a year and the other half are on $50,000 a year. And they purport to show this by measuring a wide range of metrics such as things like suicide rate, mental health rate, levels of alcoholism, family breakdown and the like. 
and correlating how equal some uh, distributions of income are with the prevalence of these of these bad things. I think that the their case has been completely debunked by a brilliant book called The Spirit Level Delusion by Chris Snowden uh, that shows that they are actually hugely selective in some of the statistics they use. Some of the correlations are nothing like as great as they claim. They disqualify certain countries from consideration that if they were included would make the sort of correlating uh, features considerably less relevant. So I am wholly unpersuaded, really, by their, um, uh, by their assertion. Um, this goes a bit to uh, Gaynor's point. And, and I suppose, to some degree, that there are two ways of looking at this wealth gap thing. Uh, one is economically, and the other is a moral consideration. Uh, in economic terms, uh, d does a rising tide raise all ships? So is it the case that you would expect the bottom 10% perhaps to be only a fraction as well off as the very richest in a free society, but nevertheless everybody to be better off than they would be in a very socialistic society? And I think there is extremely good evidence that that is indeed the case. Uh, it doesn't necessarily apply to each and every individual. You might be able to find somebody presently living in the United States of America who would, for their own personal reasons, psychological reasons, or because of their skill set, be better off in North Korea. It's just about conceivable that such an individual would exist. But across the board, I think it's uh, deeply, deeply unlikely that that applies to anything other than a, a, and a, few, a few statistical outliers in the population. On the moral point, I have no qualms about the wealth gap at all. It doesn't trouble me morally. Um, I am concerned about the position of the worst off in society, but that's actually a different consideration. And a way to look at it would be this. You know, if you could hypothetically now switch a switch and make half the population of the United Kingdom billionaires and the other half millionaires, uh, I'm not suggesting such a switch exists, but if you could do that, would you do it? You would have a monumentally less equal United Kingdom than we do at the moment if you flipped that switch. Monumentally. Uh, the top half would be a thousand times better off than the bottom half. But the poorest person in society would nevertheless be a millionaire. I have to say if such a switch existed, I would flick it immediately, without hesitation, with no doubt at all. And I think that that would be a fantastically better United Kingdom to live in than the one that we have today. On rising poverty, the, um, and particularly for the, if you like, the working poor, I know you've already had Chris Grayling speak at this um, series of lectures. We, we have managed in the United Kingdom to get ourselves into a quite extraordinary situation in which work for a good number of people doesn't pay or doesn't pay sufficiently. I can remember... I think I've got the statistics right here, but forgive me, it's a personal memory, and if I haven't got them right, they, they won't be out by very much. When I was offered my very first job in 1995, it was on a graduate, pretty standard graduate salary for the time, I think £13,200, and I had just uh, finished my university studies. And I actually, I, I definitely wanted to take the job, but for, uh, a, a, as a matter of interest, I decided to look through the numbers. How much uh, was this was going to go in tax, in national insurance contributions? How many benefits which I otherwise might be entitled to would I lose? For example, I would be entitled to free medical uh, prescriptions, which I need every month as an asthmatic if I was on welfare, but I would be having to pay for them myself if I took this job. I would be eligible for council tax relief if I was on welfare, but I'd have to pay it myself if I took the job, and so on and so forth. And at an average graduate salary in 1995, once I'd added it all up, I worked out by taking the job I would be about £280 a year better off. £280 a year for about 2,000 hours work in, in, in rough terms. That to say my effective gain in salary was you know, somewhere around 12 pence an hour. Uh, of course, the reason I took the job, um, and I've had a, you know, a lot of good luck here, 
um, perhaps a good genetic inheritance, which I could easily see that uh, if I did this job well, it wouldn't be too long before I had a job paying me 18,000, or then maybe 23,000, or then maybe 13,000. So it was a step on a ladder, whereas there wasn't obviously a welfare ladder that you could get on. But this was not a particularly uh, attractive spot price for my year at the time, to be paid 10 pence an hour. And the problem is, if you've got people who, for whatever reason, are unlikely ever to be earning more than the, say, average graduate wage, so I guess in today's terms we're looking at a salary of, you know, I don't know, 15, 16, 17,000 pounds, if that is the absolute limit of what you could earn, it is very probably better for you to go on welfare. Uh, the leisure time that you have at your disposal is enormous. And the benefits of doing a job, which typically won't be a great deal of fun. I mean, at least my job was entertaining and engaging and fun. I was the youth officer of the European movement, which was a lot more exciting than being a road sweep or a toilet cleaner. But if you actually have a job which is not going to be engaging, I think you're not going to take it. There's one other thing about poverty which I think we've got to get right, which we are starting to measure it in absurd terms, right? relative poverty. You're considered to be in poverty now, I think I've got the definition right, if you are at 60% or below the mean income. I think that's an extremely high bar. It would um, also mean that in my billionaire, millionaire scenario, half of people were in, were in poverty, which does seem to me an extraordinary way of, of measuring it. And I don't think that relative income should really be the way that we think about poverty. The IEA released, I thought, a very interesting piece of research, which I hope starts to capture the public imagination over years to come, about how we should even measure poverty. And we thought that you shouldn't really measure it in terms of income. You should measure it in terms of what that income can get you. So to give you an example, if a uh, housing prices fell by 50% overnight in the United Kingdom. No reason to believe they will. It would be some sort of you know, enormous shock to the system. Uh, that would be quite bad for relatively affluent property owners, but it would clearly be very good for the poor because housing becomes cheaper. But it wouldn't take a single person out of our poverty statistics. I find that extraordinary. And on the final point about was I being selective, yes, I was. I picked Hong Kong because it's the country I think we should aspire to, and I picked the United Kingdom because it's the country we live in. Uh, so uh, that, that, that was the basis of that selection. I did compare South Korea and North Korea, which I don't consider to be, I know that's an extreme comparison, but that seems to me to be a relatively fair comparison. And in terms of the USA and, and, and China, uh, the USA is increasingly heading down the path of being a European social democratic economy. It, it, doesn't spend as much in, in the state sector as we do in Western Europe, but it is definitely heading in that fashion. And China, and I don't want to sound like I'm the drumbeater here for the Chinese Communist Party, but in economic terms, is actually quite considerably freer than the United Kingdom. In raw economic terms, it is much closer to being a capitalist society. To give you an idea on public spending terms, in very broad terms, public spending in the UK is about 45% of GDP, in communist China, it's about 20% of GDP. Uh, we are spending more than twice what the supposed communist government of China is spending. Now, no, that justifies slaughtering people in Tiananmen Square, locking people up for their political views, but just measuring the economic side of it. China is not a centrally planned, old-fashioned socialist economy. Far from it. And part of that is because they saw what happened in Hong Kong and decided they wanted to replicate a lot of it. Thank you. More questions? Patrick Vigers. Henderson Bell and Company Limited. Um, should career politicians be banned from Parliament? Um, <laughs> alternative, or supplementary to that, what selection criteria should be applied to politicians to achieve this world which I support? My name's Nick Wilkie. I, I was fascinated by the graph about the proportion of the load on the top one and then the following 9%. And I wondered if you could just unpack that as to whether that's simply a greater proportion of a smaller scale or whether you're measuring that top 1% by their balance sheet or by their income and if it's by the latter, how that can be. And just one very briefly comment. I mean, I thought it was fascinating. Um, without wanting to be chippy, I, I, I mean, does anybody seriously disagree with what you suggested, though? I mean... I mean, don't we all know that liberal economies beget greater wealth? And isn't the point of public policy that public policy is considerably more complex than per capita GDP? So I, I don't quite get what your sort of wider thesis is. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, sorry, I just noticed as well, I ducked totally the question of what I do about Greece. I think Greece should mm. default on its debt and those people who have lent it money should uh, suffer as a consequence. I don't know if that would be a 20% or a 30%. If, if you lend your money to a highly irresponsible company that goes bust, you lose it. The same should apply to a government. Um, the, uh, on the, uh, are we going to change? Um, I don't know, you know, I mean, I go, I go through some, uh, from, you know, the, hypo the, the, the hypothesis I've given you, the, the theory I've given you. I'm sometimes enormously optimistic over the long run because I do think that the evidence for a much more liberal, liberalised free market economy is overwhelming. Uh, and I think in a broadly free society in terms of democracy and debate, I'm therefore, if you like, confident that in the battle of ideas that those free market liberal ideas will um, eventually, uh, eventually win out. Uh, I, you know, so that, that's my optimistic side. My pessimistic side is that the range of powers uh, uh, against those who believe in free market liberalism are enormous. Uh, the public sector is uh, uh, growing, uh, very well organised. Uh, it is a lot easier to motivate people within our democratic political system to campaign to, for sake of argument, keep open their local library on the corner of their particular high street You'll see all sorts of people with placards and petitions. The minute there's any suggestion that the local library on their high street is going to close down, it is extremely difficult to motivate people to actively support the closure of that library in order to reduce their tax rate by 0.01%. So across a whole range of good, you know, services and products and goods provided by the government, there is highly successful targeted special pleading by those who uh, access certain services, or in fairness, those who might value them but don't access them. But it is nearly impossible to um, politically motivate, energise taxpayers who simply aren't going to you know, march through the streets of London demanding that their income tax falls by 0.3%, whereas it's pretty easy to get people to march through the streets of London if they think they might lose their job. Uh, so the, the, the wrong political motive, the, the, the sort of, the, we've got a problem with motivation that um, it is much, much more difficult in the game of politics, in the way it's framed in, in Britain at the moment, or across the Western world, for free market liberalism to win. I suppose my optimism um, goes back to the first general director of the IEA, who said in the 1970s, when it seemed the state was growing endlessly, the unions had enormous power, the economy was performing disastrously, uh, broadly equivalent to today, I would say, in, in, in some terms. And, and Ralph Harris, then the director of the IEA, said, cheer up, everybody. Things can only get worse. And what he meant by that was that you need some dramatic single moment that brings around some sort of epiphany, be that, say, the winter of discontent, uh, be that a sovereign debt crisis. Now, it's a difficult thing to, to wish for, really, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't wish economic horror on any part of the United Kingdom or its population, but it may be that it needs some dramatic uh, wake-up call rather than us just continuing to move down the sec this sort of path. In terms of Patrick's point about career politicians, what should the selection criteria be? Well, my selection criteria is I vote for the most free market liberal person on the ballot paper. Um, unfortunately, I'm in a minority. So, uh, generally speaking, social democrats of one party political persuasion or another tend to win. But I would, uh, I'm going slightly off piece here with regard to the economy. I think that we have actually got to try and render it increasingly irrelevant which politicians we elect, rather than having our entire destiny depending on whether we've put the blue lot or the red lot in. So I'd like to see much more limited role for central government. I wouldn't say that the United States has perfected that, but there are at least some limitations on it. A lot of people say they're very worried about political apathy. I'm not. In my ideal world, I want everyone to be politically apathetic. wouldn't trouble me at all if people didn't know who the Prime Minister was, because that would be a very good sign that the Prime Minister didn't have a great deal of power. Uh, and uh, it may be the sort of person that you'd recognise in the same way that you'd recognise the Chief Executive of, say, Marks and Spencers, uh, but I think that would actually be a triumph for civilization. The problem, of course, is that the, the way that political battles are fought is all about pork barrelling, it's all about promising to hand out goodies Father Christmas-like to various different 
segments of society. And as the great French philosopher Frederick Bastiat said, you know, democratic government is the fiction through which everybody attempts to live at everybody else's expense. In terms of um, uh, is what I say controversial? Well, I'm delighted by was it Nick at the back saying yeah, it all seems to me incredibly straightforward. Who on earth would be against you in this regard? Uh, I'm, I'm not joking when I say when in specific areas you put forward some of these arguments, the scale of hostility that you whip up from the public is absolutely staggering. It's amazed me. Uh, I did an hour on Radio 4 in which the theme was, now I knew this was a controversial area, but the theme was, are we spending too much on disability allowances? Now, this is difficult moral territory. My God, of all of the areas of government spending, you don't want to be up against you know, somebody who is surviving just in a you know, wheelchair or is paraplegic and say, you get too much money. That was the way that the debate was framed. And, uh, but I put overall arguments about the, what I consider to be the preposterous nature of how we treat incapacity and disability. Although incapacity benefit is being phased out, at its peak, two and a half million people of working age in this country were claiming incapacity benefit. That is to say that two and a half million people were claiming that they were so ill that they were incapable of entering the workforce at all. Not suffering from a cold or a hangover this morning, incapable of entering the workforce at all. And the state bureaucracy has agreed with two and a half million of those claims. That is getting towards 10% of adults of working age effectively being disabled. I mean, it's not quite the same as being registered as disabled. This strikes me as a totally implausible number. Uh, I mean, maybe it just so happens that my circle of family and friends and the pubs that I hang out with have a disproportionately low number of extremely ill people. I don't know. But it seems to me implausible that one in ten people in this country are anywhere close to being uh, uh, insufficiently capable of working. Uh, I mentioned the libraries issue uh, for reasons, not that the IA was focusing on it, but I seem to be the only person, or one of very few people, who was willing to appear on television and radio to say, on balance, on a cost-benefit analysis, I think there are probably far too many libraries in the country that are a waste of money and there are better ways of getting reading material into people's hands. Y y you would have thought I denied the Holocaust by the reaction that I got from some circuit, you know, some, from, from some people, and literally, you know, literally death threats uh, on, on occasions. We um, suggested that perhaps it wasn't the best use of public funds, this was in a paper the IEA put out a few weeks ago, to have universal benefits to all elderly people. So, for example, you know, the winter fuel allowance, a, a free TV license, a free bus pass to multi-millionaires. Again, you would have thought that we had, um, you know, denied that Auschwitz ever happened from the reaction that we, we got. Now, I'm only measuring a few hundred extremely, you know, not even that, a few dozen extremely angry people that, that phone in or, or write in. But nevertheless, when you, it, it, it's one thing to say, yes, I accept that the state should be only about 25% rather than 50%. But the minute you plot the way you are going to get there, you find serious political opponents at every single stage. There was a supplementary to the question about the, ten, ten, the top 10% and where, they, where those numbers came from and what they were made up, whether it was income or capital, if I've, if I've, if I've yeah, remembered it right. It's just a greater share of a portion. No, it's, it's not. Uh, income tax receipts have increased over that period of time. So although I showed the pie consistent because I was measuring the pie as, a, as 100, uh, the, the amount of money we get in on income tax has overall gone up. I suppose to, uh, you know, to some degree it is the flip side of salaries having gone up much more markedly towards the high end and much less markedly towards the low end. I mean that's one thing that the, if you like, um, those of a left-wing disposition often complain about. You know, oh my God, well the chief executive's pay has gone up by, you know, X thousand percent over the last 20 years, whereas a worker's pay has only gone up by X percent. Uh, the flip side of that, of course, is that people contribute a much higher proportion of their income. I think that there are other, all sorts of other uh, things associated with it, but this is guesswork. I'm only looking at the outrun of the numbers. Uh, I think at some point you get a brain drain if your numbers are too high. Um, if I was taxed at 83%, I would probably leave the country and find, try and find a job elsewhere, and the income tax receipts of the nation would suffer as a result. You may very well encourage um, 
you know, greater, uh, a greater amount of work at a 40% tax rate. If somebody knows they're keeping 60p for every additional pound they earn, they may well be driven to, you know, putting in overtime makes it sound a bit silly, but, you know, working harder, seeking to get uh, promoted, seeking to move on to higher jobs. So in, 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 in relative and absolute terms, on income tax, the rich are paying more. And in my view, actually, a level which has reached what I consider to be morally acceptable. I'm not sure it is reasonable for the most successful 1% of income earners to be paying 25% of income tax receipts or the top 10% to be paying well more than half. I think at some point you can't keep saying that those with the broadest shoulders must, must bear the biggest burden. At some point the burden they're bearing is, is just big enough. We have time for one more question. So I'm going to take the one at the back there. I think your hand went up first. Uh, Don Williams, Camden Council, uh, though, should I say, um, not one of those closing the libraries. <laughs> um, I, in the journey from London to Hong Kong, while you're plotting your route, what would be the four or five things most important that London needs to do today to reach Hong Kong, no matter how much? Um, hostility that would whip up, and how long would it take us to get there? 30 years, 20 years, etc. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, I would say that the, um, and this makes me sound a bit like a sort of socialist central planner, so I'm hesitant to say it, but, <laughs> but I, I, I would say that the the first thing that you sort of got to sort of understand, if you're, if you're the governing power, I was the dictator of London, how would I shift it, is, is sort of, you know, what are you good at and how are you going to maximise being good at that? You know, I mean, what, what are the things that are really crucial and important to us? Uh, we've, of course, done exactly the opposite, notwithstanding that some of the behaviour of banks in this country, some of it was atrocious in 2008. Banking and financial services is something in which the United Kingdom is genuinely world class. And there are not that number of serious industries. You might argue in some arts and culture we're world class, but that doesn't bring in a huge amount of money. There's not that many other things that we are world class at. Banking and financial services is unambiguously, unambiguously one of them. So what have we decided to do? Smash it. Let's take, a, let's take a goddamn sledgehammer to this. Let's um, actually make it almost culturally unpleasant for anybody to be working in this sector. Uh, some of the people I know in the banking sector say, you know, you cannot now admit in polite company that you work in banking or financial services. It would be the equivalent of being an arms manufacturer or working for the tobacco industry or something. Uh, and we are bringing in a set of rules to salve our moral conscience and to beat these bankers up. I think that is profoundly unhelpful. So I would want to have a financial services regime which was I extremely liberalised and was not based on uh, either revenge or envy, which I feel much of the political debate is based on at the moment. The, the other thing I think that you have to tackle, and the government is taking a few baby steps in this direction, is welfare. It is quite ridiculous, the number of people who are not in work and then being paid for by the state, uh, and in London too. It is an absurd uh, level of, uh, of support that is available. I'm not going so far to suggest that there should be absolutely no welfare safety net at all. But I think a guiding principle should be something along these lines, that in broad terms we expect 99% of people to look after themselves over their lifetime. Yeah, I'm not going to die in a ditch if you say it's actually only 98% or only 97%, but something like that. And consequently issues such as uh, what um, health provision I might need in my 50s or what personal care I might need as I get old um, uh, become matters for me to determine how I spend my money on. It is perfectly, in my view, acceptable, indeed morally necessary for the government to say, Mr Littlewood, you are on your own, sunshine, and people who earn considerably less than me should be in that position as well. We need to get that across, not just in a kind of cultural shift, but in the way that the mathematics of the system work. How fast can it happen? It, it can happen extraordinarily quickly once the political will is there. 
so uh, if you like, if I was to go back to my optimistic point, um, if I thought this was going to happen, I think that there could be a kind of battle over public policy that takes, let's say, 20 years to win, 30 years to win, but when it was won, the results would be almost immediate. I think that you would have some, you know, if I literally wanted to bring in all my proposals overnight, yeah, there would be some serious dislocating effects. You'd have six months of quite a lot of trouble and, and distress as people had to adjust to a new system. There's no doubt about that. But the results would be almost immediate. If not within months, then within a year or two, you would start to see staggeringly greater economic growth than we're seeing at the moment. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mark. Uh, I think it's one of the interesting things about uh, these uh, seminars is I think uh, there's many people here today who wouldn't necessarily have chosen to come and hear a, uh, a seminar or talk about the free market. Uh, and I think the extremely stimulating view you've provided, and I'm sure there's quite a few people who will vehemently disagree with you in, in the audience, uh, allows... Uh, them to go and, and think about what it means. So the idea of a smaller state is extremely uncomfortable uh, for, for, for anybody because we've all got used to where we are and uh, it means enormous dislocation. Um, and I suppose, on the other hand, the uh, name of uh, private enterprise has been rather muddied by the crisis of the credit crunch. Um, and I don't think uh, industry has done itself a great, or financial services in particular, has done itself a great favour over the last few years. But it is clear that, that we have to do something about the finances of the country, and um, you've provided one way of looking at it. No doubt there are many others. So I'd like to thank you enormously on behalf of the audience. Um, I'd also like to remind you that there is another seminar um, on the 7th of July. It's our last seminar in the series, and that will be the, the, the title of the seminar is The Arts Can Help Save the Planet, a slightly different <laughs> point of view. Um, and it's by Claire Cooper, who is director and co-founder of Missions, Models and Money. Uh, so I do hope you can uh, come to that. Do stay with us uh, for uh, a drink and some canapes and chance to meet each other. Uh, so can I thank you all for coming? Thank you very much. Thank you.